You know, Ryan, there's an old Rolling Stones song. I guess they're kind of all old at this point. But it's, you can't always get what you want. Real jam from the Stones there. I heard that a lot in my It's a good days. song. It's a good song. I like the Stones. Paint it black. Shelter better. Good songs. I think that's their best. Paint Which black. one? Paint it black. It's great jam. Great song. Love the Stones. But you can't always get what you want. Then the song continues on. But sometimes get what you, you get what you need, right? When I think about this whole stadium thing, you can't always get what you want. What we all want would be a brand new stadium at the current location. If you want to put a dome on it, fine. But go ahead and queue up some Mick. Can't always get what you want. And I think that is where, as we heard from the Haslam speak on it yesterday, we know what we would all like. I know what they would like. You just can't have it. So with that in mind, you've got to pivot to something else. And the thing about this stadium discussion that just gets the people riled up on Twitter, it's one of those things, we're going to talk about it. You don't know anything more than I do. We're going off of what the Haslam said yesterday, what we've heard from some people. Everybody's now an amateur real estate person, realtor. Oh, Matt, they can't buy that land and then sell it. They'd lose money. What are you talking about? We're going to discuss a little bit on the stadium. I do hope there's some people on Twitter that I was discussing with. I hope they're watching the show this morning. Because I need to have a bigger discussion about where we stand with the stadium, what's going on with that. And I think the Haslam's, very smartly as they are, are kind of laying the groundwork on how they're going to frame this when they sit down with the city. Yeah, Brook Park, it's a little bit of a posturing move. As we know that when it came out, we continue on with what the Haslam's had to say. Andrew Barry speaking right now. At the owners' meetings, we've got updates on Nick Chubb that we'll get to pretty quick. We've got more Browns to get to, extensions, the hip drop. To, how are they going to police that? How are they going to police that? They can't even get holding right in the NFL. Now they're going to start policing tackles. Cavs with a nice win. Our boost! Yes! Finally! Back on it there. We got to talk more Cavs this morning. Evan Damra, he'll join us at 10 15. We're going to give the grid another crack. Our bracket, our boost. Time hop, morning update, all of it on a beautiful two for Tuesday right here on Big Play. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Matt Fontana. He is Ryan Tyler. Good morning. Happy to have alongside. We got a lot in the stadium because the Haslam spoke yesterday and really got. I Okay, I, dude, I just clicked on Twitter. For the real estate deals, Matt, that you're talking about. Okay, I'm sorry. There's a lot of amateur realtors out there that deal in commercial real estate. Don't you know I, that's all Twitter is? It's pseudo-occupation people? Yeah, people at WebMD it. I'm a doctor. Oh, are you? Okay, great. Actually, a good friend of mine, his dad is in commercial real estate. And I might... <laughs> I'll go to him as an expert on it. Commercial real estate. That's what my buddy Pat's dad's, what he does. What would he think? What is the value of that place out there in Brook Park? So we'll get to the stadium. I mean, there's, there's, it's going to be a lot of back and forth because nobody really knows. But I do think something that the Haslam said yesterday is a little primer on what we really want. I do want to start right up with Nick Chubb, though, because this is the latest thing to come out. This came out, what, 10 minutes ago from Andrew sure. Barry speaking down at the, uh, down at the owners meetings is that Nick Chubb is, here's the little layout of where Nick Chubb is with his knee injury. For a little while, I felt like no news was good news. When you talk about that big of an injury, the surgeries, what I didn't want to hear was setback or it's not going well. So at that point, I was just fine getting no news. Here it is 10 minutes ago from Mary Kay. Andrew Barry said this morning he expects Nick Chubb st to start doing some load running this month as opposed to conditioning work. It's a great next step. But the next three months will determine his availability for the start of the season. Good news. Great. You're telling me that that guy is going to even start running? Whether or not it's conditioning or, again, this, it sounds like strength building back up. He's going to do that, what, six months? When did he tear that? That was week three, September? I think week two. Week two, you're right. Week two. September, October, November. This, oh, my God. September, October, November, December, January, February, and I'll give you all a March. Seven months. Seven months later, and he's starting to run. The last part on the next three months will determine his availability for the start of the season. I care, but I don't. Because 
I'm just kind of resigned to he might not start the season. Can I? Okay. I want Nick Chubb here. That has well been said here on this show. I'm okay with him not starting the season. Not even from the standpoint of I want him to be healthy because I do and, and just completely, you know, get to a level that you don't have to do. I'm a little intrigued. Now, we saw what last year was without him, and it was hell. In a year where I've got to find out about Sean Watson, in a year that everybody has discussed this over and over and over and over and over again, and every article you read comes back to, well, the Browns plays depending on Deshaun Watson. We know that. All right, I, I like a couple games without him. And especially if you play well in that, then you can reinsert Nick Chubb, and here he comes. I'm completely fine with him missing the start of the season. If that has to be it, so be it. I still want him to progress here in the offseason. I still want him to get back to as close to 100% as he can be. So good news on Nick Chubb this morning. We'll discuss that a little bit later as we go on. So now we focus in on what the Haslam said yesterday in relation to the stadium and this Brook Park. Okay, they haven't even bought it yet. That was the first big twist for me. The Haslam said yesterday they have the option to buy that 176-acre property out there in Brook Park. So they haven't even bought it yet. And I sent a tweet that I thought it was interesting that they haven't done it yet. And that's where a lot of the amateur realtors out there are telling me that I'm an idiot. Somebody said, uh, somebody tweeted me this morning about it. And they said, why would you buy the property if you don't even know you need it? These people are only going to make these moves with development plans and make sure that they actually know this is what's going to happen. Matt Fontana, amateur realtor here, you know they could just sell that property to somebody else? You know you're allowed to sell property multiple times? If you buy it, you can sell it? It's not like if they buy it, the city of Brook Park comes to them and says, you can never sell this property ever again. Well, Matt... The real estate market, what if they lose money on it? You're telling me that if the Haslam's, which I saw numbers in the $40 million range, that's a lot of money. I'm not saying it's not. Even if they sold that at a $10 million loss, but it helped them get $50 million out of the city or $75 million out of the city for the new stadium, simple math that I can do, that would be a net gain for the Haslam's. Uh, somebody else said, Matt, they didn't become billionaires by making stupid mistakes. That's not a stupid mistake. That is actually a move that a billionaire would make. Now, the optics, are they powerful enough to push the city of Cleveland to have the option of Brook Park? You know, we, we, we have fun with this on the show. Imagine that Ryan were to flip this. You are the city of Cleveland. You are Mayor Bibb sitting over there. And I'm the Haslam's. And we sit down in a room. Does it come off as, I'm going to say threat, because that's a lack of a better term I could find, but it's not like it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a real threat. If I sat down and said, well, you know, we have the option to buy that place versus we bought that place. Those are two very different things. And this isn't something that has to be done tomorrow or in a month. This is a long process over years, right? So maybe they're playing the long game here. But if we were sitting down and truly starting to negotiate the stadium stuff, and I said, well, you know, we have the option of buying that over there. That's not the city. Climate. Okay, go buy it then. Until they actually buy it, I don't know if that puts the pressure on the city that the city uh, that the Haslam's are trying to do. And I don't want this to get contentious between the Haslam's and the city of Cleveland. I want to get this done. I start with a base of... I want the stadium downtown. I don't really care about a dome or not. And if it means that the only way that we are going to stay downtown is to renovate the current stadium, that is what I want. So now you come back to the negotiations of trying to get the city to pay their part of it or trying to get more out of them. That all still needs to get figured out. Then the other thing that came out from the Haslam's, they have all but shut down any other options. We had people say, okay, put it here, or is there some? They said it's either Brook Park or downtown. It's, I'm, I'm sorry, not just downtown. It's either Brook Park or we renovate the, the stadium. That's it. There is no other option in this. So at least that's some positive movement. There's no Hail Mary out there. You know, they're not going to, they're not going <laughs> to tear down the Sherwin Williams building. They just, like, there's nowhere else in downtown Cleveland. 
that they can put the stadium. We knew that. You knew that. Everybody that brings up Burke where we do our show, they can't get rid of Burke's where we do our show, right? Burke's never going anywhere. I will tell you this. Burke Lakefront Airport is never going anywhere. Whether or not that's the perfect spot for the stadium, I don't know. It ain't moving. So with that aside, you're down to two options here. And as they start to work through this, which eventually they will, I here's going to be our two for Tuesday this morning. What do you think is going to happen? Where do you think the Bre- and I want you to put this in here, Ryan. It's not what do you want. Oh, I capitalize things. Good. It's not what you want. It's what do you think is going to happen. Renovate the stadium, move to Brook Park. What do you think is actually going to happen? Because what we want, to go back to Mick Jagger and crew, is not going to happen. What we all want would be a brand new, again, I'll give you the dome, stadium over there in the lakefront. That's not happening. So now, what do you think is going to happen? No matter what, I think we're all going to have to make concessions on this. The city's going to have to make concessions. The Haslam's going to have to make concessions. And you, the fans, are going to have to make concessions. D. Haslam spoke on this yesterday. They're not big fans of where they're at right now. What did you talk about? The parking, the development, all of it. And I went to every home game outside of COVID for about five years straight. I didn't, this past year, I didn't. I've been down there as a fan. I've been down there as a media member, all of it. Is it great? Is it perfect? No. What a lot of people hate is the traffic getting in and out of the game. When they shut down East 9th, when you can only go down to East 55th and have to loop on back around and there's an hour and a half line coming up the marginal to get down to Cleveland Brown Stadium. I hate that. We all do. It sucks. Leaving. The swell of people. I, I Ryan, that's the issue. When people leave the stadium, there's only one way to go, and that's southeast. Yeah, a lot of them are walking back to Muni Lot. Some of them can come up third, but for the vast majority, there's only one way in and one way out. That is the main issue with the stadium of where it's at. I guess, put my engineer hat on now, is there a way to fix that? Is there a way to ease some of that? I don't know. I really have no idea. So that's another thing as we think about the stadium of where it's at. If you know you're going to have to go back there, then maybe they could put some resources and effort towards fixing some of the problems of where you're at. It's kind of like, like me. I live in an old house. My wife and I live in West Park. Our house was built in the 30s. There's problems. Can we tear our house down and rebuild it? No. So what I keep doing is little things to try to get it better. Is it perfect? No. Do I have squeaky floors? Yes. Are they a built-in security system? Yes. (laughs) Nobody's breaking into my house, Ryan, without stepping on a squeaky floor and waking us up. I don't need ADT. I got squeaky floors. We're good. I do the best that I can with what I got. That's what the Haslam's and I think the Browns are going to have to do with the city of where it's at. I'm already casting my vote on our two for Tuesday this morning. What do I think is going to happen? I think they're going to do the billion dollar renovation. I think that's what they're going to do. And Brook Park is still there as a negotiating as a pawn in this game. But I also, okay. We know the Haslam's do not want to foot the whole bill for this, right? Correct. We've had the discussions about Brook Park, Ohio, and what you'd be. If you can't get $500 million from the city of Cleveland, what makes you think you're going to get it from Brook Park? And that's then a $2.5 billion renovation or a bill. So what you're saying is you're you're basing it off of that you think – the city of Cleveland. If they're fold. trying to squeeze right. this out of a stone of the city of Cleveland, what right. do you think you're going to get from Brook Park? So by voting that you think it's going to stay downtown and we're going to renovate it, that's based off because you don't think Cleveland's going to fold. I just, well, it's not that Cleveland's, I do eventually believe that the city of Cleveland will come in with some cash. But you think that'll be later? Yeah, we're early in this. They're, here's the thing. They're probably not even going to start plans and development for another year. 
this is all just, and again, I know you got to get your contract signed. You, you're not going to do anything without the money in place. The, the, the little bit of construction that I know my brothers are in the trades, you don't start a job without a deposit down. You don't start a job without a signed contract. It's one of the golden rules in life. Don't do anything until that thing is signed, man. So they're not going to break ground on anything. They're not even going to start talking to architects or civil engineers until the money is figured out. And that's the right way to approach it. Eventually, that clock will run out. The sand will run through that timer because the lease is up. And they, how, how many more years do you want to play in that city? Every, and that's where on the micro level it matters. We're talking about a day or a month here. Think about it, though. Days and months that cost you now will cost you years, potentially, because if you don't get it started by this date, you can't finish by this date, and you've got a season to play. It's not like you can say, well, you know, we'll get started. Instead of finishing in September, we'll, we'll wrap it up sometime around Halloween. No, the Browns are playing. You have to be done, and if you're going to wrap it up in October, you've missed your season. You're done. you got to play your games and you start again in the offseason with whatever you're building up. There is importance to this. And I think, I mean, I don't think, I know this. They're going to start pushing. It's going to ramp up. It's going to start to ramp up where, again, we're talking about days and months that are getting costed now. Eventually, it's going to come to a head. you got to start this. I would imagine, it sounds so far off, by 2026, you have to have some sort of plan. You will have the plan by then. And sounds so far off, but it's going to be here before you know it. And then it's not even just the amount of money. Then you start talking about months of planning, bidding on the job, who's doing, like, all of it. The renderings, what exactly are they going to do from the stadium? And the other thing, once you pick your plan, you got to dive in. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? If it's what I think it's going to be and them renovating the stadium, okay. Are we talking about taking some seats out and putting up a new scoreboard? Are we talking about structural moves here? That takes a long time to figure out exactly what do they want to do with the stadium. And the final thing, this is going to miss the mark. I know that. But it's just how I feel. As a fan... Outside of the traffic, once I actually get to the stadium, I got no problems. I've been in loges. I've been in suites. I've been in the media box. I've sat in the 500s, and I've been near the field. Been all over that same as a fan and a media member. It's not that bad. I've been to other stadiums. They are crap. I will tell you, Cincinnati Bengals, that stadium is an unmitigated disaster. It's trash. That needs to go. I've been to Lucas Oil Stadium. That's a nice stadium. Again, I've been there as a fan and a media member. That's a nice stadium. They don't need to do anything. Just get a little upkeep here. The the Browns would push back. There's things we need, right? There's probably a, 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 a thousand things, a giant list of things that I don't even know about that they need to change and upgrade, and that's really the swell. But I would ask Browns fans that go to the game and maybe even season ticket holders, is the stadium really that bad? Is it something where really you just blow it up? It's I don't I don't get that vibe. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. No, I, mean, I don't think it's that bad. Again, no. the traffic is the biggest thing. Yeah, but and even then, I mean, me and you, we're we go to, when we go to a game, and this is probably most people, but there's you know there's people like for instance, millions, thousands of Browns fans, my mom, you know, people that aren't that involved in the game. That sure they like the, the, the extra extremities there, but I, when I go to the game. I don't do anything besides sit in my seat and watch the game. Right. And maybe I know I'm being a nostalgic. You go to the concourse. I'm being a yeah, nostalgic right, right, right. Nelly here. Yeah. I get it. But like, yeah, I I love being downtown, well, man. And that's you bring up a great point. I don't need to do what the Guardians are doing with beer gardens and drink rails. You don't do that at football because when you're there, you're there to watch the game. Baseball's got its own problems where It's now becoming a rare thing that people actually sit in their seats at Progressive Field and keep score and watch the whole game. No, they've got to come up with the other glitzy, glammy things to hang out. It's almost like you're going to the bar that just happens to have a baseball game going on right outside of it, right? Football's not that way. Yeah. 
It I can is tell you the amount, that's I, it. I can tell you the amount of people that, and me included, like when I go to a Guardians game, I mean, you know, if I if I get there a little bit late, the third inning, I still have an amazing time. Oh, it's a great time. And no yeah. complaints. If I miss kickoff, opening kickoff for a Browns game, I freak out. You know that sw- you know that groundswell of people that start walking from Muni Lot. We've all been in Muni Lot before, right? You're sitting there, you're having your beverages, and you see about an hour and a half before kick. Here comes some people, and then it starts picking up an hour 15, and then about an hour out, and you just get this massive movement of people over there to the stadium. The one thing about the stadium, and again, it's not the stadium per se, it's the location, is the people that uh, need uh, handicap parking. AD, like think about the walk, Ryan. That's not a walk for some people. That's that. It's a treacherous walk. It's ten minutes that you're walking from anywhere. You park in the flats. You park on West Third, wherever you're at. It's not easy. And they've tried over the years to be better about some of those parking. Uh, you know, freeing up that. What are you gonna do? Because the renovation is not gonna fix those problems. The biggest issue with the stadium will still not be remedied with renovations. And that would be one of the biggest keys why people want it to go to Brook Park. Because that fixes the biggest problem. You're landlocked and you're in a crappy spot. I just don't see it happening. Matt, does, does parking bother you? Well, I'm Where jaded. does that rank? Okay, up? I'm jaded because usually when I would go, I would have media parking, which is right there. But even when I was in Muni Lot, I was a young guy. So it was easy to walk. I think about this. You're talking about, I'm I'm probably going to give you more apt comparison. The next game that I go to as a fan, I will take my son. And I don't know if it'll be this year because it'll be three. I'd like him to actually have like memories of it. So when I go, my son will be four or five. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I don't know about Muni lot, but I will find another lot somewhere downtown And him and I will take that 10-minute, 15-minute walk to the stadium to take that in. Those are great memories. Sit in the stadium, watch the game, walk home. Am I going to have to carry him for a chunk of that? Yeah, probably. And we get in the car and go home. I'm not a season ticket holder, though. So I don't have to do that eight times. But I know season ticket holders, they've got their game plan. They know what they're doing. So, no, it doesn't bother me. That's the thing. As the casual fan that goes to not every game every year, no, it doesn't really bother me. So maybe I'm wrong to be speaking on this. Go talk to your season ticket holders and how far away they have to park. That's it. That's it. The stadium itself, I don't think is that bad. So your biggest issue still won't be remedied by the renovation. That's, again, not going to get everything you want. It's going to be, you got to have to make some concessions and acquiesce to some things. The one thing that Haslam said, yesterday that kind of made me question it so here's what d haslam said this is from mary Kay's article we looked at can we solve the issues on the waterfront for our fans it's hard to get into it's hard to get out of we have no parking i think that's really important to us as how to solve those issues and when you start thinking about what cleveland can be and the vision for this city i think we underestimate what a great place it is And I don't think there's an opportunity here, perhaps, to build a dome stadium that can transform our area. That's something exciting to think about. We're looking at both options. Neither option is above the other. But I do think Cleveland deserves to be thought of as this evolving, forward-thinking, creative city as opposed to not thinking big. They want to stay. I I, I take D. Haslam at her word. That one option is not above the other. But if you ask them if it was just up to you, they want to stay. Why would you not want to stay in downtown Cleveland? As the Cleveland Browns, we know the history of teams leaving and coming back when they brought the Cavs back from Richfield. You need the Cleveland Browns to play within downtown Cleveland. That is my number one goal in this. And I think that's where the Haslam's are leaning to. They need a little bit to come from the city. And they'll figure everything else out. I'm, I'm sure this has been brought up, Ryan, but if it hasn't, send this over to the Browns. What if they just built a parking garage on the north side of the city or north side of the stadium? Now, you might say, you got a big, ugly building over there now. Even if you did a three-story parking garage, you know how much extra parking that would be for people? That lot is full on Sundays. Now, that lot is also a good chunk of, again, media, Game personnel people, uh, you know, uh, executives, the Browns um, valet is there. 
the friends and family part there. So imagine you still have all that, and you added even just two more levels for fans. Sounds like an easy solution to me. Now, in the current state, because I know that's not flat ground. You have to, when you pull into that parking lot, you got to go up a hill. I don't even know what that would cost. I don't even know what that would look like. And maybe they would come back and say the same thing. Why the stadium can't have a dome, the land can't support it. The lake is right there. I don't know. But if your main issue is parking, what if they just built a parking garage over there? The only thing that would ruin for some people is the one or two aerial shots during the game over the blimp. And you see this giant concrete parking garage. Because a lot of the stadiums, right, what do you see? When you see the aerial shot of Jerry's World, you just see this sea of cars. You see this sea of cars all around it because there's nothing around. The only one that's a little bit different is Green Bay because it's in the backyard of some people's houses. And they'll never get rid of Lambo because it's freaking Lambo. Why don't they complain about parking? What do they do there? I don't know. I think they're going to stay. I think it's going to stay downtown. I think they're just going to renovate. And there's a lot of questions on what that renovation looks like. Is it cosmetic? Is it internal stuff? I don't know. Ryan, catch your vote on our two for Tuesday this morning. It's not what do you want. Yeah. It's what do you think is actually going to happen with the Brown Stadium situation. I was going to vote the new stadium at Brook Park, Matt, but I think you swayed me a little bit. Good. I think you swayed me. So I think I'm going to... I'll answer think, the I, negotiations I, 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 with the city. I'll talk to Mayor Bill. I got a line to Mayor Bill. I think I'm going to vote that... like, And this is also what I want, like you. I want it to stay downtown, and I think a billion-dollar renovations. What swayed you the most when I brought it up? Um, the money thing where was, I was like, if you can't get this money out of Cleveland, what makes you think you're going to get it out of somebody else? That and also like they haven't bought it yet. And you, you mentioned of Cleveland being like, OK, good. Go ahead. Then, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's 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 a lot of planning and I just don't know if it's in the cards. All right. So I want to read through some of these tweets that I got this morning. So I sent a tweet out that I said the Haslam's haven't even bought the land in Brook Park. Not quite the threat to the city yet. Mike tweets me, once they buy the land, there's no going back. So it's about as much of a threat as they can make before going all in. And I came back and I said, they could just turn around and sell it. And then Rob tweets at me, sell it to who though? You're telling me somebody would not buy that property? Again, even if it was a loss that the Browns and the Haslam's recouped on the money they got from the city, that sounds like a smart money move to me. The Heights on Twitter. For the real estate deals of this scale, the playbook of smaller investments does not apply. An investment bank buys millions of shares and immediately tries to resell them. The market price is significantly altered, unlike a random Robinhood user who trades hunch. So, okay, the heights pr thing is, he's talking about the stocks, right? And it's when you buy something quick and you sell it right away, that's a little bit of, that's a red flag usually, right? But what he's saying is the people that are buying and saying, dude, you just, you just bought that. What do you mean? What's going on here? Two things. The Haslam's are not short for cash. It's not like they spent their last $40 million on this and they've got no money. I would assume that they're okay to sit on it for a little bit. And eventually when the right deal comes, the deal will come. Somebody else said, Matt, that it's been vacant for a while now, ever since they tore the Ford plant out. Why hasn't somebody else bought it? I don't know. It's a great question. I guess my comeback would be, you seem to be a perfect spot. You got the highways. You got the airport. Maybe I am making this sound too easy to just flip this deal and flip it all around and that kind of stuff. I just keep coming back to the price tag that I saw. It's 40 odd some million dollars. I think it was appraised. I can't remember. I think it might have been the transportation blog that I got it. It was somewhere, maybe it was sold then for $37 million or something. So even if you bought it at 40 I just come back to, even if you sold it at a loss, but it helped you get money out of the city, that seems like a good move to me. The other thing. There are no other options. And I'm sure the Haslam's looked into this. Did they go out to like Northfield? Did they go to... I, I don't even know, right? Warrensville? No, Did they go out to Avon? Right There's where, a big old parcel of land right, where right off of 90. That'd be kind of sick for me. In Warrensville? Northfield. Yeah, right, Northfield, North right? <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking like uh, of me driving around the city where are places that I see giant open fields, right? Yeah. You go down 90, Avon, because my favorite driving range in the world was right there, and it's gone. 
R.I.P. Right up, like right before 83, is that Nagel? Or Nagel's right there. You get off, there's the uh, there's a get-go on the corner. And what did they do? They developed that whole area. There's a Meyer over there now. There's a big old stretch of parcels because they built all that out. There's a Menards over there. There's Duluth Trading over there. They put Cabela's in over there. There's. I'm just thinking, did they go around and go, all right, maybe we go to Avon. Maybe we'll go to Northfield. Maybe we we'll go to Warrensville. I would imagine there's not enough places. So literally, Brook Park was not, okay, This I don't know this. I'm just thinking this. They picked Brook Park not because it's a good option. It's because it's the only option. As they sat down and tasked their people with finding legitimate places. I'm not talking about going to Akron. I'm not talking about somebody that's 45 minutes away. Where else could they have gone? People are missing that. They get so drunk on just a new stadium. You realize, and this is a debate we've had over and over again, I don't think Brook Park's a good option. You want to talk about traffic? 480 and 71 can't handle the rush home. They can't handle the morning and afternoon commutes. What do you think they're going to do if the stadium's over there? Then, and it's another tweet that I got from people, the development, Matt. They'll just develop Brook Park. Why don't you just develop over there then? I've heard this my entire life. The lakefront development. I feel pretty confident in saying that it's a bunch of bull crap and it's not going to happen. Maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to be wrong. I'm probably not. Everybody wants Chicago, Ryan, where the lake is right there and they got parks and beaches and people use the lake. You're not getting in Cleveland. Tell me I'm wrong. Whether or not it's Burke Lakefront's fault, whether it's, I, I don't know what else to tell you other than the fact it's not going to happen. And I think the biggest detriment is the one we've discussed. It's Route 2 and the, and the, and the railroad tracks. You are cut off. It, imagine that. If they weren't there, think of the buildings. Think of the things that you could put in there. You just can't move, can't up and move railroad tracks. You can't up and move a, a highway. Develop that. Oh, Matt, they'll put the hotels and they'll put the restaurants there. Who would go there outside of events? Now, the comeback. Well, Matt, they'll get SummerSlam. They'll get a Final Four. They'll get all this other stuff. I'll believe that when I see it. I will believe that when I see it. Okay? All I've ever heard over and over is the development of the lakefront. I'm here. Just let it go. Doesn't bother me. It really does not bother me. When I want to go enjoy the lake, I live on the west side. I take Rocky. I take the boat out in Rocky River. When I want to go to a beach, I just drive up to Sandusky. My wife's family, my family has a place up there. That's just where we go. Other people, it's different, right? They want to be able to use Edgewater's right there. And Edgewater on a nice summer day on a Saturday, it's packed. Good. The park there is great. I see it all the time. People having picnics, family reunions. Great. What is the thing about that area right in downtown? What is it? And then the other thing, you know what takes up a big chunk of that is the port. Think of that land. I just saw it this morning. I see it every morning in my drive-in. Nothing you can do. People act like they want to do something. And this isn't a shot at Mayor Bibb at all. Every Oh, yeah. that Gung-ho, man. Let's go. We're going to get the lake from. That's on my agenda. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I don't know. I'm sorry to be negative on that. I'm sorry to be a little pessimistic on it. I have no belief in it. I have no, no faith, and I frankly don't need it. I don't really care. No on Twitter. I'm pretty sure he's agreeing and saying renovate and stay downtown. He pulled out his dictionary for this response, oh, so, all right, go so ahead. bear with me. Yes. No on Twitter. The lipstick on a pig is not a nostalgia play. It's an urban development pattern issue that continues to balkanize our region when we should be promoting dense urban development instead of suburban sprawl. I don't know what balkanize is. I looked it up. Okay. It, it's like separating... A big unit into so smaller. What he's talking about is, units. and I'm assuming that this is where we're going with this. Instead of spreading out from down, let's worry about downtown. That's exactly. Let's what it worry is. about what we're doing That's downtown. What I gather from that comment. When you go downtown and you still see vacant businesses. Good tweet, and, Noah. Yeah, it's good tweet. Like. That's a good point. When you go downtown and you see restaurants that can't stay open, when you see vacancies for for buildings and things like that. Now, granted, the Sherwin Williams building is great. That's a lot of money in flux. The thing about Cleveland and the battle that they have had for a long time 
is it is viewed as a commuter city. And what I mean is that people come downtown to go to work and then they go home. There's not many reasons to stay downtown. But you saw, you have Playoff Square, you've got the games for the pro teams, things like that. It's unlike other major cities where people that usually work in Chicago, they live in Chicago. Even, I'll give you a closer one. I've got some like secondary friends. They live in Minnesota. They live in Minneapolis. That is a city a lot of people live in downtown. That was the other thing. How many buildings have we seen that they fill up all their apartments now? Bro, see, every building is getting flipped into apartments. Are they <laughs> actually getting sold? I don't know. Welcome to post-COVID. But that's what, and you know, let's talk about COVID too. That had an impact on this. The tweet is right. Let's focus on fixing this downtown before we start spreading out. The Haslams have to still look out for their football team. They're not the owners of the city of Cleveland. They're the owners of the Cleveland Browns. They got to look out for their team. And that is where you need these two sides to come together to say, let's help each other. Let's have the Cleveland Browns help that development of city of Cleveland. Let's help the city of Cleveland help the Browns help us. That's what's getting missed in all of this. And I just don't think Mayor Bibb wants to go down as a guy that let, let that team go to Brook Park. John Wick says he's feeling really odd because he's agreeing with you. He doesn't yeah. like it. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm, I'm just bringing up how I feel about it. Well, the majority thinks that it's going to be a brand new book. It's because that's what they want. I, I, I think that's I, what I, they I, want. I fully capitalized. Things. I know you did, but sometimes people don't read on Twitter. That happens. <laughs> it happens. No. Trust me. Yeah, right. No. They, they, or they listen to a clip of our show for two seconds and then make some grandiose. So uh, people sometimes don't read and listen on Twitter. As this, as this continues forward, as this just, I, I hear what the Haslam said. I just think it's going to be there. From, from Mary Kay's article. D. Haslam rejected the notion that their dalliance. What the hell is that? <laughs> dalliance, a casual romantic or sexual relationship. I don't think that's what she meant. It's a brief or casual involvement. So we're talking about a casual involvement. D rejected the notion that their casual involvement with Brooke Park is a negotiating ploy. So she's saying, no, 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 no. This is actually real. Doubt that. To get everything that they need from Mayor Bibb for the $1 billion renovation, which they would like to be a 50-50 split with the city, county, and state. That's Don't forget that, too. It's not just Cleveland. It's Cuyahoga County and the state of Ohio can come in on this. That's, dude. I... You're getting stressed out. You want to know what stressed me out right there? 50-50 is not unfair. And I know $500 million could fill the room up that we're in right now with dollar bills. I get that. It's the city, county, and state. I'm not asking for a lot. And again, it's $500 million. But that's not just coming out of Justin Bibb's pocket. That's not just coming out of my pocket. You got to say, get DeWine on the horn, man. Just get Taylor Swift to be a Brown that, fan. Uh, yeah, sure. That'd be nice, too. Fine. Like, that's what I, I don't. I am not sitting here spewing for the Haslam's. I'm not. What I, what they're asking for is not that outlandish. It's not. And that's why I don't understand why people are so up in arms about what they're asking for. What they're asking for, I think, is fair. And if the brat, okay, flip this around again. What do I always say when you want to fire a coach? That's fine. Who are you going to replace him with? You want that stadium gone. What are you going to put there? Apartments. Like, that's what I'm saying. What are you going to put there? It's going to be apartments. The city of Cleveland. I ask you for a legitimate reason or excuse of what you would actually put there here's a little key it's not gonna be a park what about like a mega hooters what I, they couldn't even keep <laughs> tilted kilt open man they couldn't even keep that open it was right across from the casino what about like a a, a thousand a hundred thousand square foot joe flacco statue sure it's joe flacco world they got a little roller coaster <laughs> and it represents the season you know, the first tail is the start. Watson gets her, you know. It's Cedar Point 
the Flacco Flyer. It's Yo, the big wait, roller wait, coaster wait, we there. Might, we might be on to something. An NFL-themed amusement park you would get be a little, sick. You get a little footballs that you spin around like the eggs with the kids. That you can do that. Sick. You know how they do like in Epcot, I think it is? Like you can go to all the different worlds and get and a drink around the world. A drink around the world. I've done it. Like a ride around the world. Like Okay, well, that's fine. That'd Flacco be, World. I would go there. I, that is kind of my other th- If I was sitting down in these negotiations, I'd look at Mayor Bibb and i go, what are you going to put there then? Oh, we'll come up with something, will you? I just, I'm so, I guess, beaten down, but also, I just, what, what you, like, oh my God, man. What are you going to do? What, what are you going to put there? You have no choice but to leave the Cleveland Browns where they're at. I think the Haslam's know that, and the city of Cleveland knows that too. They want to argue over a couple hundred million dollars that I get is a lot of money. I, man, come on now. Come on now. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. They're going to stay there. They're going to do the renovations. Whether you like that or not, it is what it is. Two for Tuesdays up. Always two questions, two answers. First one up, what do you think is going to happen with the Brown Stadium? We'll get to that. Our second one, tis the season, Ryan. March Madness or the Masters? You get one or the other. It's a really good question. Thank you. I try. We're in the middle of, obviously, uh, March Madness. So there's a little sway. But if you could only have one, March Madness or the Masters, you know where I'm going as Masters. There's no question on that for me. It's one of my it's my favorite sporting event of the year. So do you know, Ryan, the busiest day for vasectomies in the world? Or in the United States? For vasectomies? Yeah, because you know when you go and get snipped, you gotta be like off your feet for a couple of days? The day before the March Madness tournament. Do you know when I will eventually go to get mine? The day before the Masters tournament starts. Because then I gotta sit I gotta sit around on Thursday and Friday. I can't get up. Sorry, I just said surgery. You need to get a vasectomy? I'm going to eventually, yeah. Eventually, yeah. Two's and I think two might be enough for the Fontanas. We'll see. We're leaving the door open for now, but two's a lot harder than one. I'll tell you that. Much. I always like want to test my limits on saying things, but like, never mind. All right, no. Keep the show on the air, Ryan. Let's just keep that going. There it goes. Masters, March Madness. Your vote? Um, I'm I'm big fan of both, but for me, it's March Madness. Like, okay. I I just I think it's the best couple weeks in the world. Yep. So we got massive change to the kickoff rule. They are doing what the XFL and the UFL is going to do. So here's how it works. I'm trying to visualize this. Adam Schefter sent the tweet out. The receiving team will have a line of 10 players on the 30-yard line and one returner. The kickoff team will have 10 guys lined up on the 35-yard line. The kicker kicks off. And the second the returner touches the ball, it's on. So imagine, again, a line of your 10 receivers, a line of your 10 kickoff guys. They've got five yards in between. The second the guy catches the ball, we're on. Block your guy. Go make the tackle. What do you think? It's passed. It's a new thing. We'll get to the hip drop tackle later. We got more calves to get to, more things coming out from the NFL owners meetings. Your thoughts on the kickoff return now? I, I don't know. I I, th- I think it's something I have to see to kind of feel like if I like it or not. I mean, it, it takes back, obviously. It, 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 I mean, it goes back. I can't wait to see what Josh has to say on the return, obviously, tonight. Oh, yeah, it'll be tonight. Because, yeah. I mean, you're going to have records that I feel like now really have no chance to be broke in terms of kickoff return touchdowns. I mean, I got to imagine it's going to be very few, right? I would say this is the last gasp of kickoff. This is the last gasp of them just getting rid of it. The thing is, they're reduced because what they didn't want was the run up. So remember, the first change was that guys on the kickoff team used to start five yards back from the ball. Then now they started at the ball. They still have 25 yards to get up to speed. Now they just have five. The only thing about the kickoff, they just want to stop concussions. They don't want to stop the kickoff. They just want to stop the injuries. So how do you do that? You only give these guys five yards to run. That's it. And then they're in, then they're they're making contact with the other guys. And I know that there's a bunch of statistics already from the XFL and the UFL about the reduction of concussions on that play. And then let alone the impact, I think it's going to change things by, I think I saw on average, they believe this could change starting field position by about five yards instead of just taking it at the well, 25. Because yeah. now well, I would also well, think, This is going to be more kickoffs in play. I think you're going to have more teams actually kicking off in play now. Well, now you can, now it's a potentially touchback at the 40, 30, and 20. How's that? As I'm reading this. 
from CBS NFL. Okay, read that through, yeah. please. So, okay, touchback at the 20-yard line. If a ball hits the ground in the landing zone and then rolls into the end zone and doesn't get returned, the ball will go out to the 20. Touchback at the 30-yard line. If the ball is kicked into the end zone on the fly, the receiving team gets a touchback at its own 30-yard line. You follow me? Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, yeah. And then a touchback at the 40-yard line, which is just kind of nuts to think about. If the kickoff doesn't make it past the return team's 20-yard line, then the ball is considered out of bounds, and the return team will get the possession at its own 40-yard line. <laughs> so many fans. That's, that's a lot. I mean, it man. makes sense. It's kind of easy. Can to you follow, do me a favor? Go to Schefter's Twitter. I want you to pull the video up. I want to play it for the people so they can see it. Okay. The visual that Schefter has is going to make you understand everything about it. Just search Adam Schefter on Twitter. He sent it uh, sent about 20 minutes ago. It's literally just the clip from, you know, an XFL game. Yep, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Sorry, Ryan's working his magic here. Put me on the spot. I'm sorry. I know. Should have probably gone to break, but we're having the conversation right now. Doesn't got to be perfect. All right, there you go. You got it? Here we go. Watch. So, again, they kick it off. See the two teams just standing right there? He's got it. And now we're off to the races. I don't think it looks that bad. I don't, to be honest, I, I don't hate it. I, I really don't, don't hate it. I don't, yeah. I, I don't hate that. I mean, sorry. I think it works. Obviously, everything in the NFL now is to do with reducing concussions. Injuries. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting. It'll be and, it'll be something and I have to feel out. That is better than just getting rid of the kickoff. Yeah, no, that, I, that, I that's like what I'm saying. That that's better in a world of not having a kickoff or having that. I'll have that. I'd rather have that. At least there's yeah. a play to be had here. But don't you think now people like Devin Hester and Josh Cribbs, like I don't think the records can be. Touched. Oh no, they'll they'll yeah, like and again, even more of a reason why Josh should be in the Hall of Fame because we're done, man. That's what I'm we're saying. We're done. We're done. This the yardage will never be there. Um, it's it's just I'm yeah yeah. So again, of either not having it or at least having this, I'd rather have this. All right. So we have a lot more to get to. The extensions for Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski were discussed a little bit yesterday. That's all but uh, a formality. They'll get those done. We got the hip drop tackle, and also I did catch on this on ES or I'm sorry, on NFL.com this morning. The best, strongest position groups coming out of this draft. It helps the Browns. We'll get to that. We got to get to some Cavs as well. Do you want to push the grid back? You want to talk Cavs right now? Well, up to you. All right, let's talk some Cavs. We'll do the grid now or two. We'll do it after timeout. So Cavs. All right, nice win last night. We're going to talk to Evan Damrell coming up in fifty or at ten fifteen this morning. He's about a half hour away. That win doesn't really make me feel all that better. Okay. You had, you had Marcus Morris, who clearly had to light the team up a little bit, get a little bit of swag going, change things around. Our guy, George Niang, starting to hit it up a little bit here. That's a solid win. So be it. Congratulations. I need more. I need more. Did I see the Cavs play a little bit better last night? Yes. Did I see some things with Evan Mobley that got me a little excited on that one play? Sure. Did Jared Allen have another great game? He, I do. We should have thrown him in for a double-double. That was a lock last night after an off game. The Hornets, and I'm not trying to like have hyperbole here, that is one of the crappiest basketball teams I think I've ever seen in my life. Now, that being said, they are tanking. I get that. They're all in on Bridges and Brandon Miller, as they should be. I think those guys are good. Other than that, they were clearly, like, whatever. You beat a tanking team by 20, what is it, 23? Good, great. You did your job. Fantastic. We've got some bigger games to come. But I do want to talk to Evan this morning. Because one, my biggest concern was what I was seeing with this team. And I want, and maybe Evan has this, and maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's joining me on this. Are my concerns legitimate? Are they founded in truth? And I don't look to last night to either, you know, affirm what I feel or detract from what I feel. Because that game to me was nothing. That game was nothing. If they'd have lost, we'd be having a lot different conversation this morning. I look nothing into that Cavs game last night. You did what you were supposed to do. Will I look something into maybe that 76ers game coming up? We got one more with the Hornets tomorrow. Probably not the Hornets tomorrow. Nothing. 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 I will, I will look nothing into these games. So where do the Cavs sit as they're staring down the barrel of going out to this West Coast trip? The other news with the Cavs yesterday, there is no timetable for Donovan Mitchell. That's scary. It's not even like he's close. It's not even like he's back to on the court stuff. At minimum, Ryan, I think he's two weeks away. Minimum. He'll be done with that West Coast swing. 
We'll be staring down the barrel of just trying to get him some regular season action before the playoffs. That could change a lot. Maybe it changed a lot. Maybe it changes nothing. I don't know. But we'll talk to Evan Damrell coming about that, about 10 15. That Cavs game, it was nice. It was a good win. It's solid. That's all I really asked for. But I really read nothing into it except for our boost. Yes, Tipico, let's go. A little hockey. A little hockey. A little puck for you. We hit it last night, folks, on a nice catch for the Cavs. Can we go back to back? Let's get it. Tonight, Blue Jackets, 10 o'clock, Phoenix, who are not great either. Take the Jackets plus a goal and a half. Little Cole Sillinger. Little Johnny Hockey. Sad news this morning that the Jackets were officially eliminated from playoff contention. It's over. It's over. B future is bright for my Jackets. So we wanted to do a Jackets boost because we only have they only have like 10 games left. So we'll get a couple more of these in. Rolling out. So again, three legs for tonight. All Jackets. Ryan, what do we got to boost it up to? A healthy plus 656. Woo! Right now, Tipico logging in. Let's go. I'm in, baby. Here we go. Bonus bets. Cash back. Let's see, under Ohio trending bets. It's already there. Let's go, man. Let's go. Place bet. Placing bet. Little up on my cash back parlay or cash back rewards, excuse me. Typico's where it's at, folks. Still need some credits for the tournament. Use that code FONTANA100 for new customers. Deposit and bet $25 on whatever you want. Get $100 in bonus bets to use throughout the tournament. Baseball, hockey, basketball playoffs. And do not forget about the cashback rewards. Where am I at right now, Ryan? So the, the cashback rewards, there's parlays and there's straight bets. So right now, cashback parlay. I'm at $38 of 100. When I fill up to get to my 100, I will get an average, the 5% average bet that I've spent. I get that back in a little cashback reward right there. And here's the thing. It still works for bets that you win. Like my, it, it went up for me on the cashback rewards when I placed that bet. That's how it goes with Tipico, folks. They are, I, I dare say, one of the easiest cashback it's not about oh you get this token and then you cash it in for this or it's only these certain plays versus that pretty simple anything minus 200 or better anything minus 200 or better you are going to get cashback rewards add it up for that and eventually getting your money back it's so easy it's the best with Tipico. yeah then the imperfect parlay boosts we got it all get signed up today with uh code fontana 100 all right you did mention josh cribs a little bit later we got the return tonight we've got this big play uh oh no we got enter the jungle tonight yes with james rapine yes, and crew yes, so yes, we got yes, it all yes. for you right here on big play we've got more calves coming up we'll get to that with evan damerall and we've got more with the browns real quick did you have this in the in the, in the update the barry Stanford nc extensions yeah Let, did you okay so we'll talk about that coming up a little bit but can we talk about this before we go to break? Yeah, sure. Do you think basketball is in a weird place in the NBA in terms of college, G League, international players? Because I'm looking at this mock draft, Matt. Oh, sure. This is the first one I've, I've ever looked at this yeah, year. Picks it on there. Let me read you this mock draft's top ten. Okay. They have the Wizards. And, and, and let me know if you've heard of this player. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not as in tune to basketball as I am football, but I don't think many people have heard of these guys. Washington Wizards. Alexandre Starr. No. Perth Wildcats, Nothing. 18 years old, nationality French. Nothing. Detroit Pistons, Zachary Rissacher. Nope. Team JL Borg and Bresse. Okay. Three, our first, Reed Shepard, Kentucky. Okay. Uh, yeah. Charlotte Hornets, Ron Holland, G League Ignite. Okay. Cody Williams, Colorado. Rob Dillingham, Kentucky. Okay. Seven, Nikola Topic. Another S Serbian guy? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, there is a giant rise in European basketball, and there are guys that used to come over to have to play college. It's now just, they can just play over there, and then the G League is kind of... The thing is, we are no longer in the era of the best NCAA players going in yeah. the top of the draft because you go back to even years... Um, God, what was that one draft? It might have been Kyrie's draft. What was Johnny Flynn's draft? I don't know. But, like, yeah, the top 10, you were all like, oh, yeah, that guy played for Syracuse. Oh, yeah, that guy was at Kentucky. That guy was due. That's not where we're at anymore. 
And I think teams are all searching for kind of the same thing. It's not just that they're Euro. Everybody wants Luka Doncic. Everybody wants a Giannis. They want some 6'8", 6'10", guy that can stretch the floor. Where they come from, I don't know. The thing is, what it tells you, that the best basketball players are not in college anymore. They're just not. The G League thing is going, did you see that thing about they're trying to create basically a G League for high school football players well, now? Well, they just got rid of the G League team. What do you mean? The Ignite. They, Shams, I saw a tweet. They're getting rid of it. Oh, are they? Of yeah. the high school kids? No, of like the, the G League team Ignite where we've seen like... Yeah, Jonathan but the Ignite are, are meant... So the, G, the rest of the G League are meant to be actual professionals. Ignite was meant to be the high school kids. Oh, yeah, they're getting rid of the high that, school the, yeah, They're yeah, just yeah. getting rid of that. Yeah, no, I understand that. It just... There's something I don't like about it. And especially... So I, I saw this the other day. They're supposedly trying to create a football league where guys can go play and make money off of NIL and then still be somehow eligible to go play in college. Because the college rule is you got to, you know, you're graduating class. You've got to wait for that and then go. There's some, I don't like it. You're not doing I, school if you're doing that. That's man. what I'm saying. Like, how do they don't graduate? I, I just, and I'll tell you this. I am the biggest football fan that you can, one of the biggest football fans you can find, right? I love the NFL and I love college. I'm not watching that. I'm not watching that. No. I'll watch the UFL. I'm not watching a bunch of high school kids play. Absolutely. I'll go watch high school games when my son plays or when my nephews play. I'm not watching some league with a bunch of high school kids. It just seems, I don't like it. There's something about it. A little unsavory for me. Yeah. I just keep thinking of Bishop Sycamore. You know, like that's what it's going to be at. These guys think, oh, I don't got to go to school anymore. I can just get paid to go play football. Sure, I'll do that. Then I saw they said they have like f four and five star recruits lining up out the butt to do this. Okay, fine. Go at it. Because you know that there's some greedy person sitting there going, I'm going to make a bunch of money off of this. Yeah, I'm going to make a mean, bunch of money off kid, these kids. If you're a kid, you're 16, 17, 18, and you get a chance. Yeah, to, who wouldn't sign who up for that? that? I get it. No, I completely get it. I do. All right, let's catch our break. When we come back, we're going to get through the morning update. A lot more stories in there. This betting thing with this kid in Toronto. We got Shohei Otani we got to discuss. It's all. Morning update comes your way next. Now, stay with us. Fontana Show right here on Big Play. Well, how do they know I'm doing this? Did somebody leak this out? It's social media. Oh. It's just, that's the way social media oh. works now. I thought maybe you were just running that yep, 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 yep. Welcome to Big Play, a sports media team that started back in 2014, and now we're not in a garage. Look at us, incorporating some of Cleveland's favorite sports personalities, bringing you fun and compelling content from downtown Cleveland. Coming to you live from the shores of Lake Erie in Burke Lakefront Airport, join Team Big Play for all the best sports talk in Ohio. Check us out on social media at Big Play, bringing you fun and compelling content from downtown Cleveland. Anthony Schlegel, just how physical he was. <laughs> you know, you saw, saw the, the girth and the power and everything he was bringing to the table, especially when he was a nice, beefy 255 playing middle linebacker. We were called soft last year. You don't want to be soft, especially when you come to the playoffs. So that's going to be a process throughout this season of establishing us as a harder team you know, here in the How does an Ohioan build the perfect parlay? Who's got something? Big guys looking for long odds. The kids in Columbus are covering better than anyone. And at even odds. If it's even, I'm leaving. Listen, our championship DVD starts today. All right? Dude, I just got an invite to a Cincy playoff watch party. Shut up. Cincy, State, Cleveland, the perfect parlay. I'm a genius. For the best odds on Ohio sports, bet with your cojones. It is Spanish, dummy. Bet with typical sportsbook. I don't buy into this nonsense, this conspiracy nonsense that he's got his money and he's dogging it. He, that's ridiculous.
Let's get to it. Ryan's got the morning update. A lot of stories, and we'll get to some betting things. Baseball and basketball related this morning with betting. It's not really related to Shohei Otani, but he spoke yesterday. We've got this Porter story. Let's go. Morning update. Take it away, Rock. Already, well, we started the morning talking about the current Browns stadium dilemma, but other Browns news yesterday is the Haslam's came out and said they are expecting and waiting pretty soon, hopefully, extensions for both head coach Kevin Stefanski and general manager Andrew Barry. I'm kind of, I really am shocked that they're not done yet. Um, I thought they would be. That being said, um, it's a formality. There's some things they want to discuss. There's some things they got to figure out. Maybe they're going back and forth on years, but... The thing is, Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski, what are they going to do? Deny a deal? What are you going to say no? I think it's going to be a standard three-year extension beyond this season and a little pay raise. I, I would think that'd be easy to figure out. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Um, but I feel confident. I feel I, I'm happy that these guys are going to be here continuing in the roles that they're in. They deserve it. There's no question. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? To sit here and say unequivocally, I know there's some of you out there and you know who you are, you're wrong, but to sit here and not even blink an eye to say, yeah, extension, no problem. There's no debate to be had. Yeah. Oh, Stefanski, this play call here. Oh, uh, you know, Andrew Barry missed on David Bell. Doesn't matter. Does not matter. None of that actually matters. They'll sign these deals whenever they finally get them done. You got your head coach and your GM for, I hope, a good little while here. Good job. Great job. Go Browns. Already with the Cavaliers bounced back against the Hornets last night. A slow start, but they turned up in the second half. And they have a quick turnaround off today. But tomorrow, they're back at it against the Hornets. And hopefully, we'll get two wins in a row. Yeah, they should. I can't read anything into that game. I'm glad they won. I'm glad that some guys were able to fill it up a little bit. I read jack squat nothing into that game. I know. The Hornets are bad. They're tanking on purpose. We were off to a slow start. I got worried. First half was 2020, or first quarter. Dude, I don't know me. how that overhit. And I did that. I don't know either. I had a bad beat on another bet, but that's okay. But anyway, like, I thought, here we go again. And if the Cavs are going to continue like this of not scoring, then they better play defense and shut the rest of these teams down. I'll tell you that. If you're not going to put up meaningful points, which again, for the Cavs last night, they ended up with what, 115? Solid. Great. Fine. But... You're, you're not going to be playing these teams all that. I don't want to fall into bad habits either, but I don't care. They got to win. That's all that matters. Box score are plenty. Sure, fine. Guys hit some shots. You beat a really, really, really bad basketball team. That's how I look at it. Well, boy, Matt, gambling is in the news more than ever these last couple of weeks. Right. Toronto Raptors forward Jonte Porter is now under investigation by the NBA following multiple instances of betting irregularities over the past several months. So the thing is, if... If, and now let, let, let's play this out a little bit and get, get some context. So, John Tay Porter, he had this streak of not only just leaving a game due to illness, but then whatever. That's just one part of it. It's when these books get thousands of dollars bet on something like that. And I go back to... Um, there's a really good documentary. There was a series of documentaries about like unsavory sports stories, right? They talked about this Formula One driver that was a drug trafficker and all that. And they talked about Headache Smith. If you don't know who Headache Smith is, he was a guy, Arizona State, back in the 90s, and he got caught point shaving. He got caught point shaving. Went to jail. The bookie that he was working with went to jail. And they interviewed him and the bookie. And the bookie talked about it. He goes, Back in then, I still had to drive to Vegas. I had to drive and fly to Vegas. And he goes, what I would do is, I knew he was playing, and he knew. I would tell him. There was a whole part of this documentary that they would call, he was, somebody would call headache, and they'd give him the spread. And they say, I need you to win by X. And usually it was like, um, you know, the spread was 12. I just need you to win by nine. And they would take the, they would take the other team to cover. So that's all it was, was he would get the number and you know. And that was the whole bit. Hey, I don't need you to lose the game. Just don't win by more than this, right? What the bookie would do is he would go to Vegas and he'd be placing these bets. But he got found out when he would walk in and go, here, I'll take 10 grand on a Tuesday night random ass basketball game. And they took it once or twice. But when you would do it over and over and over again, they'd mark you and they go, watch this guy. And then he's tried going to other books. And then they started compiling it. FBI found him out. Not hard to get. Now, 
you know, these books are going, well, wait a minute. What's going on? One of the games, so January 26th against the Clippers, there was an increased betting interest on the under for Porter props. That night, it was set at five and a half points, four and a half rebounds, and one and a half assists. That evening, he played just four minutes because you got to play in the game before he left due to an aggravation of an eye injury he suffered in a prior game. He did not score, but had three bound, or three rebounds, one assist, all the unders hit. The very next day, as part of the reporting, DraftKings stated the under on the Porter's threes was the biggest money maker for betters on any NBA player prop that night. Wow. Not Giannis, not Jokic. It was Jonte Porter. Maybe they and said a that mass is feeling. where they go, well, wait a minute, Hugh. Hugh, you're windy up. Why would they do that? March 20th, he played just three minutes before exiting the game due to illness after attempting one shot and grabbing two rebounds. The next day, DraftKings, number one winner for the fans again. At least one other sports book took an unusual interest in the betting props. And one industry source told the ESPN that multiple betting accounts upwards of ten dollars and $20,000 on Jonte Porter props. You're gonna get caught. What's one of my rules, Ryan? You're gonna get caught. How easy is that for them to see? And now in the social media era, in how things, that stuff gets circulated so quick. He had to have been in on this, right? Oh, 100%. if he's out there shaving, you have got to ban him for life. Yeah, absolutely. Literally. And maybe this is good. And I'm not trying to take out this kid. And maybe it's all just a weird coincidence. But if he was involved in this, you have to ban him for life. You have got to make an example out of this. Now, this wasn't a star player by any stretch of the imagination. A source said people were trying to do whatever they could to bet Jonte Porter props. And then just a few days ago, the same thing. We had a bunch of people all trying to do the same thing. He's a brother of Michael Porter Jr. He's on oh, a two-way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's making $415,000 on a two-way deal. He's about to get kicked out of the league forever. If this is true that he was actually shaving points. Time to get a job, buddy. That's insane. That is insane. Raptors became aware of the investigation. Because now you sit there and you ask the Raptors. You're like, well, wait a minute. Now, this is as simple as he goes, oh, my stomach hurts. My eye hurts. I can't play anymore. What are they going to do? Say, like, all right, get back out there? I don't know. This is, I'm shocked it kind of took as long as it did for this to happen. I really am. I thought it'd be a lot quicker. And this is a nice little reminder. Don't tell me that when this doesn't get figured out, that baseball and football is going to be sending a nice little memo to people to go and just a quick reminder for you here. We're talking not only banishment, he's going to go, if if an innocent will proven guilty, there's a lot of damning evidence here. If he did this, he's going to go to jail. He's going to go to jail. It's going to be bad. I guess, again, I just thought it happens quicker than it did. We'll get it all figured out. We'll wait for more stories to come out. But, dude, it, 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 too much of a coincidence here. Too much of a coincidence. All righty. Well, speaking of controversy, Matt, Shohei Otani had a, a pre- well, I don't know what to call it, a press conference, and he says he, he, he read had a, no he read idea. He yeah. said he was shocked about his translator stealing his money. Yeah. Um, How did he steal it? Okay. So of the three viable options in this whole Shohei Otani story, number one, he was trying to help his friend pay off his gambling debt. Number two, Shohei himself was betting or number three, he was actually the victim and got money stolen. Obviously, it's number three. He said it got, how? Did he steal your phone and Venmo you, Venmo himself a bunch of money? Tra- I, I just, how, like, and Shohei's got millions of dollars. Even with all the deferred payment stuff, he's still got a lot of money. If I were him, I'd be going to my accountants and going, how did this not raise a red flag? I'm assuming this guy didn't do it in $5 increments, right? I'm assuming this was chunk cash from time to time. How they missed that, I'd, I'd fire my CPAs right away. I'd expose their ass on this too. I guess I believe him. I have to believe him. It's what he said happened. That he, the guy stole the money. Okay. 
That guy's going to go to jail too. Um, I guess that's the easy thing, right? Is that not the easiest of all? The other two are messy. Shohei betting is the messiest. Then it's messy of like, if he was just paying off his buddy's gambling debt, is that really all that bad? The money was going to an illegal bookmaker. I'm sure there's taxes involved and all that kind of stuff. The easiest, simplest solution for everybody is this guy stole the money. So if that's what really happened, or if that's just the narrative, I don't know, but it is the easiest outcome for both Shohei and Major League Baseball. Did you see the picture of Shohei from, uh, I think, like a year ago that was circulating? He was at a, a college basketball game. I, I, I forget what game it was exactly, but it was pictures of him, and he did look very nervous, and people were saying, oh, I know that face. That's the face of a man sweating out a parlay. Well, now, and uh, and a little, uh, is Dave Roberts still the manager of the uh, uh, uh Dodgers, is he not, right? Oh, former... Yeah, he's the manager of the Dodgers. If I'm Dave Roberts, a little piece of advice, man. You need to separate Mookie Betts and Shohei Otani in the lineup because every time that they stand on the on-deck circle and you say Otani Betts, it's just a meme now. That's hilarious. You didn't see that? No. It was... It was I, I don't want to say the South Korea series, like whatever game. Literally, Shohei's warming up and Mookie Betts is standing right next to him and the last That's name funny. says Otani Betts. That's funny. What are you going to do? Come on. I'll take him at his word. Guy stole the money. I want to know how. I'm very interested to see how he stole this money. Maybe we'll get that answer. Maybe we won't. All right. We'll last here for the morning update before we get to Evan Dameron, Matt. This morning, the NFL announced a rule change to the kickoffs. Now we're going to an XFL format, Matt. I like it as opposed to getting rid of kickoffs completely or this. I'll take this. Also, just past this morning, they moved the trade deadline back one week. Oh, they did. So the Browns had a proposal to work to week 10. They took the Steelers' proposal of week nine. So they moved the trade deadline back one week. Browns wanted two. They only got one on passing that. So, again, all these rules are coming out. We didn't even talk hip drop tackle. How the hell are they going to do anything about that? How are they going? And I know there's a lot of players that are really upset by this. How are you going to tackle a guy anymore? And, and I'm still a little confused. Is it a fine and a penalty at this point? Or is it just a fine? I don't, dude, it, the policing that is going to be such a headache. And they, they, th listen, they sent the videos out. They sent a bunch of videos out to try to teach teams and players, this is what you don't do for a hip tackle. This is what we're going to call. Bro, they do that with holding. And they do that with defensive pass interference. And they still don't know what it is. They still don't know what actually qualifies. It's going to be the interpretation of a rules of an official. It gets messy. I don't like it. I think it's stupid. Now, again, I'm not for ankle and ACL injuries. I want to stop that, too. How else are you going to tackle a guy? How else are you, what, are you, what else are you going to do? Black football. It's pretty, well, that's what everybody was freaking out about. J.J. Watt and Javon Holland. All, everybody's upset. I get it. It's just another example of the NFL leaning offense. They will do everything in their power to put up points. So much so that they're limiting defenders tackling. Think about that. They're limiting. And again, you can't horse collar a guy. You can't face mask a guy to bring him down to the ground. I'm talking about your arms are wrapped around him. You're bringing him down, and that can now result in a flag. Well, Maybe they'll teach it up. Speaking of injuries, you want to talk about the Cavs? Yeah, let's get to the Cavs. Evan Damro going to join us this morning as well. As always, Evan, really appreciate your time, man. Cavs got it done last night. Evan, I just got to start. That game did nothing for me in changing how I feel, how upset I was after that Timberwolves game, how the Cavs have played recently. So, Evan, I start right there with you. Did last night change anything for you for the Cavs to make you feel better about where they're at? Well, I have to ask you first. Are you a little bit less on the ledge? Because when you first asked me to come on, he said, I need you to talk me off the ledge. I'm still on the ledge, sure Evan. Okay. I, uh, that's why I needed you on here, man, because... Listen, this, uh, let me lay it out for you. And so I love having you on because it's just, we have a conversation. I'm not interviewing you. We're just having a conversation here, man. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'm putting this on you unfairly. Bro, I was in such a bad spot. I was in such a bad spot. Specifically, when I saw the Cleveland Cavaliers, who are an NBA team, have 50 points with a minute and a half to go in the third quarter. I was in a horrible spot after that heat game. And Under, that, that's understandable. Sure. My, my wife was just like, 
how many points? They score. They, they almost score 50. fifty and a quarter, right? Like, okay. And she said, "Is it still the first quarter, or early <laughs> second? I said, "No, we're almost in the fourth quarter." She's like, "You're joking," and I yeah. said, "No." And she's like, "Why are you watching?" I'm like, "Cause I have to for work." Well, you, yeah, right. That's kind of what you do. <laughs> of course, you can follow Evan on Twitter. I'm not Evan. Down Euclid the podcast. Check him out there. So the reason I felt in the place that I did, and I think I'm still there a little bit. It's just the bigger issues mm-hmm. of this team looks so disconjointed, not running clean offense. It's a Darius Garland thing, which I want to talk to you about him because I want talked off the edge about him too. Evan, it's just they don't look good when Donovan Mitchell's not out there. And it's mm-hmm. easy to say, he's Donovan Mitchell. He's so good. What I wanted you to do was come on and say, hey, Matt, don't worry. Here's some advanced statistic or something that, no, no, it's not as bad as you think. But Evan, that's kind of where I'm at, man. It just looks so sloppy and poor basketball when Donovan's not out there. Yeah, the eye test will definitely tell you that this is not very healthy or conducive offense. And I think how they responded against Charlotte is a little encouraging just because the Hornets really walled off the paint from Cleveland. Because if if anyone knows anything about Charlotte basketball, is they haven't had a good big man since um, Al Jefferson in the early 2010s. So it's just like you know it's something the Cavs could like exploit with Evan Mobley and Jared Allen out there and then the Hornets walled him off and the Cavs responded appropriately and went bombs away from three-point range in the second quarter and really stretched out Charlotte's defense again so like that's encouraging but yeah overall like this team is rudderless without Donovan Mitchell out there and you can attribute a lot of that to injuries fatigue asking guys to play a lot more than maybe what they're accustomed to but I understand the general frustration because before Donovan Mitchell came here, this Cavs team was very talented behind Garland, Mobley, and Allen. And I understand the frustration when, even though Mitchell's out, like this team falls apart, like they they can't be too reliant on one guy. But I think there's just like reason for optimism just because they have a softer quote unquote stretch of their schedule right now with this game against Charlotte on Monday. Then they have another one on Wednesday against the Hornets. And then... The, the Sixers won't have and beat on Friday, which I guess technically makes it softer, but they still have to deal with Tyrese Maxey, which is not a fun trip in the park. But if you can kind of just manage that and just kind of ride out that storm, and I guess the optimism for you to kind of pull you back off the ledge is at least what JV shared with me last night. And I had to frame this question very carefully because if you ask about a player's status with JV, he'll just say, oh, they're progressing or they're getting better. They're doing a little bit more day by day. Like, you know. The, the responsible thing to do by not like putting out public expectations on these players to kind of rush them back to the court or anything. But he did say that he expects Mitchell, Wade, and Strews to play before the regular season is over to get them some minutes and on-court reps just to shake off that rust and also build continuity for the first time this season heading into the playoffs. And he explicitly mentioned that this upcoming road trip that starts in Denver, then goes to Utah, Phoenix, and then both LA teams, he's like, these are high pressure situations that will allow the guys that are trying to get back into the fold and also the guys that are just already out here get used to high pressure situations and just like, you know, adverse environments that they'll have to deal with in the playoffs. And hopefully at least, you know, everyone comes back sooner rather than later, but it could be staggered. It could be not, but I think the storm is more or less over. It's just how much longer the Cavs can ride this out. And, yeah, I agree with you. Like Garland hasn't been great. Um, and then just like watching this team on offense is a bit of a slog. But I think with Evan Mobley back, like defensively, they can just lean harder and harder on that. Grind teams to dust on the defense and then just do just enough so the offense can get them enough points to secure a win. Evan Damerall joining us. Of course, follow him on Twitter. M not Evan down Euclid. Evan, that's kind of, you know, I, I the idea of – they're injured, what do you want them to do, right? And I know that that is the truth. That is a fact that rotations have had to change. You're missing at times four of your rotational players, two starters, sometimes even three. I guess I should be more sympathetic and understanding of that. Yeah. Is it that simple just to be like, what the hell did you want them to do facing all the adversity, let alone that hell stretch that they were on? What was it like? Uh, what was the stretch they were on? It was like 15 games in 20 days or something like that, 24 days, something insane like that. They got a bad yeah. schedule and they got hurt. It's 15 games in 24 days. That's I what, think yeah. the schedule being a little bit condensed because they had to go to Paris to start the season was a little tough. And then, you know, 
the all-star break is always it's an opportune time for players to rest and recharge but it's also it was inopportune for the Cavs because they had a lot of momentum going into the break and then coming out of it you got guys that are dealing with random aches and pains and injuries mostly Mitchell um, with his knee becoming an issue and then Evan Mobley's ankle being an issue soon after that but yeah, you, you can be empathetic, but also I have to push back just saying that this team is also just too talented to be completely cratered if they're missing, like, a star guy, because they still have, like, I remember when Mobley and Garland were announced out for a month plus back in December, everyone thought, like, oh, this season's over, but the, the Cavs dug deep, and it was pretty easy to kind of remember that, oh, they still had Donovan Mitchell and jared allen on this roster and sure like i think there are limitations compared to what mitchell gives you versus what like garland mobley and allen together can give you but yeah, i think it's just it's the general grind it's 15 games and 24 nights kind of thing and just there's another grind coming up where they have this western part of the nba road trip because they have to go through like i said denver phoenix and both los angeles teams and utah which you know it's they're not a good basketball team but the jazz are a tough place to play on the road so we'll see how it goes it's just also you i under i just understand the general frustration of like yeah this team's a little too talented to be struggling like this and kind of just either coming out lifeless like they did against miami where they just can't handle the pressure very well or they just kind of struggle against lesser opponents and the game gets out of hand where they're just digging themselves out of a hole that they put themselves into. Evan, Darius Garland, I want him to be kind of it. I, I know he's not it. I know it's Donovan's team, the future. And I try not to think about what Donovan's going to do this offseason and all this other kind of stuff. Where mm -hmm. are you at with Darius Garland? I guess my thing, Evan, unfair or not, I wanted him to take a bigger step forward with Mitchell out. And I'm not saying that every game I needed him to go off for 45 and go beat mm -hmm. the Nuggets and go beat the best teams. But there are just games against average to below average teams that I wanted Donovan, or I'm sorry, Darius Garland, to put up 25, to put up 30, to even take the last shot. And I got to go to Karis LeVert to win mm -hmm. games. I've got to go to other guys. It's just leave me, it's left me wanting, lacking a little bit when it comes to Darius Garland. Evan, I can't turn a blind eye to. We know this team can't stay the way that it is. You've got four guys. It's only going to be three probably moving forward. I I, I, I got to admit, man, I'm in a bad spot with Darius Garland. Your thoughts? I understand why people might be in a bad spot with him. But to be fair to Darius, he has been dealing with injuries all year long. I think this job surgery, he said it was the worst injury of his career. And he said last year the eye thing was the scariest thing he's dealt with because, you know, he couldn't see out of the left side of his face. So... It's just, you know, the, the the disparity or the, just the weirdness with that. But he dropped 15 pounds when his jaw was wired shut. And he's still, he admitted, I believe, last week or two weeks ago that he's still not 100% physically. Like, the weight isn't there. And I think it's pretty clear that, like, he is kind of adverse to drawing contact. Like, if he drives to the basket, like, he's not successfully drawing contact and getting to the line like he typically does. Um, or at least when he was at the beginning of the season. And then... You see him settling more for like mid-range jumpers, which are, you know, ill-advised because he's a smaller guard. It's easier to close out on him when you're doing that with a big man. And the three-point shots just aren't in rhythm and in motion. And I think he is struggling still just to learn how to play off the ball. And I, I understand the frustration. He His third year, he was an all-star. He has an extremely successful breakout campaign. Last year, the cohesiveness with him and Mitchell was really good, but... I agree. Like going forward, if Donovan Mitchell sticks long term, it's Donovan Mitchell is the number one option on this team. But I think Darius Garland is kind of entrenching himself in that spot where he can be a very good second or third star on a championship level team, which, you know, isn't a bad thing to have. And I think also if you have that, like that's a great, good problem to have if you're Cleveland. But I think it'd be foolhardy to say like, oh, they should trade Darius Garland and fully centralize things around Donovan Mitchell because I think the potential is there. It's just unfortunately like it's been with Evan Mobley it's or the Cavs in general it's kind of a lost season because of injuries and you're trying to do the best you can with what you have but Garland said the focus for him is just to make sure he's 100% ready physically come playoff time so I think there's gonna be moments where maybe he seems passive or he's not being dominant but I think it's still him feeling out his body and trying to get back to the proper in-game shape and health he wants he or the Cavs want him at 
and then they just kind of work from there. But I really do think like him losing that weight was so inopportune because he's a smaller guard. And when he draws contact, like he's trying to get to the free throw line. But if he's not big or strong enough, it could result in another injury. And I can understand the hesitation and not wanting to have to deal with that because, yeah, the offense is on his shoulders right now. And they are turning to Karis LeVert sometimes, who was on a bit of a hot streak until the game against Miami and Charlotte, where he was kind of one note. But it's yeah i understand the frustration but like a positive for me is like you watch the game against charlotte garland didn't score a ton but he was moving the ball like crazy he had everybody involved in the offense he was racking up assists a lot if there's a way that he can contribute and if it isn't his scoring it's the strength and numbers approach that the Cavs have utilized a lot this year and he can just be the figurehead of that to just to get everybody else rolling whether it's mobley allen george niang who was on a heater against the hornets like He's such a creative and smart passer and playmaker that if his shot isn't falling, he can sure as heck make sure everybody else's are. Evan, I I never thought we'd be here in a fight for the three seed. You know, there was a time we were talking to, we even let ourselves dream about tasting down the Celtics. That's all out the window. Where we stand this morning, Bucks have a two and a half game lead on the Cavs in two. So I would say that's almost gone. And you don't have any head to head matchups with them to try to knock that number down. Then we're in third, just a half game up on the Knicks, a, a game and a half up on the Magic, and I want to bring up the Pacers in the 60s. If we fall that far, I'm going to have a heart attack. But I want to stay in the top. Evan, how do you think it plays out with the seeding? How concerned are you with the Cavs? And really, how important is it that they stay there in that three seed? I would say it's important if you are looking at the second round to stay in the three seed because you want to avoid Boston as much as you can. Like, I know Cleveland – did beat Boston at home and like it, it that was kind of an improbable win it was Dean Wade going unconscious in the third and fourth quarter and they barely eked out a victory but like the, the Celtics are the best team in basketball and if you want to make a legitimate run you want to avoid the very best as long as you can and hopefully if you somehow draw them let's say in the conference finals they have to deal with two rounds of two teams throwing themselves at Boston trying to take them out whereas for Cleveland, you look at if they're the three seed, if they somehow catch Milwaukee and flip-flop with them for the two seed, that's even better. But you want to kind of focus on that path and hope and pray that you don't draw Miami in the first round. Maybe you draw Indiana because they have become such an odd team to me because they were so dominant to start the year, but they've just completely fallen apart since they traded Buddy Heald to the Sixers. But you um, probably, like, if ideally, maybe you want to draw Orlando or Indiana in the first round probably be an annoying matchup but like you can take care of business against them maybe get those guys who've been out for so long a little bit more comfortable and also you know wash off the stink of last year's first round exit and you know avoiding the knicks would be great too i think if you're cleveland and let's say it's in the second round it's new york boston cleveland milwaukee and i know the bucks have been playing better but the Cavs have played milwaukee very well this season so i think like that would be an I don't want to say they're the overwhelming favorite, but I wouldn't say the Bucks are either because Isaac Okoro has Damian Lillard's number. And if you're able to exploit that matchup and kind of just hone in on cutting off one of the heads of Milwaukee, um, it makes it a lot more palatable to deal with a guy like Giannis or Chris Middleton, who isn't 100% either. But at least in that case, that's a little bit more of a cleaner path to the conference finals. So right now, looking at the seating, you want to stay in that 2-3 conversation. It is a really frustrating because you have the Knicks biting right at your ankles. You have other teams that are just like waiting for you to kind of keep floundering like that. But ideally, you finish two or three because if you finish four, you're probably heading up to Boston for the beginning of the second round. And that could be a very ugly series for Cleveland just because the Celtics just have so many players and personnel that just the Cavs can't match. Evan, great stuff. I do feel a little bit better. I do feel a little <laughs> bit better. I I, I think bit. the win last night, just kind of talking through things. Let's see how it goes. He's just with Darius Garland's there. Uh, re- last thing real quick, you mentioned uh, sure J- JB just kind of said to hope to get to Mitchell back, hope to get Struess and Wade. Anything that you're hearing, any be- like is it just going to be the last couple of games of the year for Mitchell? Do you have a fear about him getting back up to speed enough for the playoffs? Any insight on the injury front? Um, not necessarily. I think when Brian Windhorst said is kind of what a lot of people are hearing too, that these guys are aware that they need to get back onto the court sooner rather than later. But the focus is getting ready for the playoffs. Okay. And I think the Cavs are a very smart organization and they are responsible when it comes to player health and safety. Like they aren't going to rush guys back because they 
have a couple stinkers during the end of the regular season when basketball is just kind of at this weird time where a lot of teams are just mentally checked out ready to start the playoffs. But we'll see if they get back. I think that's just a win if you're Cleveland because you can shake off a little bit of that rust. You can get them a little bit more comfortable and acclimated to the flow of how things are going. And then you have about a week off because of the play in tournament before the play playoffs actually start. So instead of using those practice opportunities to kind of get those guys up to speed, you can start fully game planning and fleshing out a game plan for your opponent in the first round, which would be ideal if you're the Cavs. But no, I haven't heard, heard any serious updates. So, but anyways, I was surprised that JV was kind of willing to reveal his hand a little bit because he is usually pretty steadfast and like not disclosing any updates on players health unless it comes straight from the team because like he doesn't want to jeopardize player safety or anything like that right undo expectations oh hey you'll be back next week like, nah yeah. maybe we need to get these guys flushed out a little bit evan always appreciate your time man go check him out on twitter am not evan down euclid for all the writing all the podcasts it's all there evan appreciate it man we'll talk to you before we get out to that west coast swing all right Absolutely. Talk to you soon. There he goes. Evan Damerall joining us. I do feel better. I do. I feel a lot better there. Just, I, I, I got tilted, man. I just got so tilted from that Miami game. And I know I, I read Fedor. I, I, we listen to Evan. Like, it's just got to be, man. They, they, they got a bad stretch. They got hurt. What do you want me to do? Donovan, that's kind of, I, we're all hoping sooner rather than later, right? It doesn't sound like it's going to be anytime soon, but. I mean, okay, it, win it, these games. Yeah. Give me a little bit better feeling here. I think Evan's points about the the seeding, about more the second round, staying away from Boston, just always great stuff uh, there with Evan. If you missed it, you can go back to the replay uh, after the show, YouTube, on Twitter as well. But I do feel a little bit better. I do. Yeah, I, I, and nothing's really going to ease that pain until you see yeah. it translate to the right. court. And we know that. Yeah. And with Darius Garland, I mean, it, he, Evan said it. You can't really understate that injury. He said Darius said it was one of the most tough, if not the toughest, of his career thus far. And I mean, losing 15 pounds isn't a joke. I mean, we we know it's it, it's easy to criticize these guys as they're on the court almost every night in the NBA, but really only time will tell. And yeah, Evan seems okay. You know, obviously JB, he said, you know, these hopefully get a couple games here before we start the playoffs. But as we know, only time will tell with all things. All right, we got to catch a break. We got time up. We'll get to the grid. The world is lit on fire with this new kickoff rule. People are pissed. We'll dive back into the stadium discussion. We'll get to our typical boost and... Final week. Downtown, Tremont, West 25th. Submit your bars. We're pretty much filled up. Just a couple of spots. We'll get to that all when we return. Fontana Show, right here on Big Play. Well, how do they know I'm doing this? Did somebody leak this out? It's social media. Oh. It's just that's the way social media oh. works now. I thought maybe you were just running that yep, 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 yep. Welcome to Big Play. A sports media team that started back in 2014, and now, we're not in a garage. Look at us, incorporating some of Cleveland's favorite sports personalities, bringing you fun and compelling content from downtown Cleveland. Coming to you live from the shores of Lake Erie in Burke Lakefront Airport, join Team Big Play for all the best sports talk in Ohio. Check us out on social media at Big Play, bringing you fun and compelling content from downtown Cleveland. Anthony Schlegel just how physical he was. And you saw, saw the, the girth and the power and everything he was bringing to the table, especially when he was a nice beefy 255 playing middle linebacker. We were called soft last year. You don't want to be soft, especially when you come to the playoffs. So that's going to be a process throughout this season of establishing us as a harder team here in the How does an Ohioan build the perfect parlay? Who's got something? Big guys looking for long odds. The kids in Columbus are covering better than anyone. And at even odds. If it's even, I'm leaving. Listen, our championship DVD starts today. All right? Dude, I just got an invite to a Cincy playoff watch party. Shut up. Cincy, State, Cleveland, the perfect parlay. I'm a genius. For the best odds on Ohio sports, bet with your cojones. It is Spanish, dummy. Bet with typical sportsbook. I don't buy into this nonsense, this conspiracy nonsense that he's got his money and he's dogging it. He, that's ridiculous.
right, we got a lot to get to in the last 25 minutes of the show. Welcome back. Fontana Show right here on Big Play. We got time off. We're going to give the Immaculate Grid a run here today. We'll see how it goes. We'll get to our boost tonight for the Blue Jackets, our bracket, revisit the stadium. Let's go. We start with time off. If you're new to the show, first off, welcome. Second off, we tell you what happened this day in history. 26th of What the happened in March? I got April breathing down my neck. It's still in the uh, the 40s and 50s. I had a snow day in April, my senior year of high school. The first week April, we had a snow we had a snowstorm. Welcome to Ohio. I guess, man. Here we go. 26th of March. Uh, four years ago, to me, three years ago today. This day, 2021, the Dolphins traded the third overall pick in the draft to the 49ers, who would eventually take Trey Lance. Now, here's the interesting thing. As soon as the Dolphins made that trade, they went back to 12. They traded up to six with the Eagles like five minutes later. The 49ers reportedly said that Jimmy G was their quarterback. Here's the other interesting thing. The Eagles reportedly want Zach Wilson out of that draft. They end up taking Jalen Hurts later on, and oh boy, what a bullet dodge there on that one. Saved some jobs. Yeah, it was. Uh, this day, 2018, a giant source said that they were not shopping Odell Beckham. Okay. Well, all right. That would be one year later that they would trade him, but that was always a thing there with Odell. Uh, this day, I'm sorry, 1979. Would you say one of the more historic days in NCAA history? You got Magic, you got Bird, you had them for the NCAA championship. Happened this day, 1979. It was Magic and the Michigan State Spartans got a 75-64 win in the national championship. But that would really only start between Bird and Magic, who ended up uh, their rivalry continued into the NBA, spanning 37 pl- uh, games and three championships. Who had a better career? Magic. Probably Magic. Mm-hmm. And Bird's great. I would say if you ask me who the better player was, I might say Bird, which is crazy because it's Magic. But we don't. I don't know if we have those rivalries anymore. Like, LeBron, Steph was a thing. Now it's like... You know, do you think Giannis and Luca have a you know a grind? Like, no, like I, there's nothing with that in the NBA right now. Now you see like Luca and Jokic wanting to team up. Yeah. Man. Now you got Draymond Green fighting his coach. You see that, by the way? I don't think that was real. I saw it from Woj. Oh, actually? Yeah. No, I think that was a Woj fan account. I don't know, man. I think it was a Woj fan account. Hang on. Adrian Wojnarowski. Did I get hooked? Yeah, I think. Did so. I get hooked? Doesn't it say, like, fan or parody? Oh, what? okay. I'm glad you caught me here, Ryan. Am I right? Yeah. I don't see it on Woj's account. You're right. Good call. Got me. I'm not even going to continue on. Damn fake news. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you caught me. I got to go find that person and, and block them so I don't get hooked again. Uh, this day, 1953, Jonas Salk announced what vaccine? What did Jonas Salk create? Is that polio? That is correct. The polio vaccine. This day, 1953. Here's a really interesting one. I don't even, obviously this story goes back to, I don't know when, but here we go. This day, 1947, Cleveland Indians manager, Lou Boudreau, ordered player Jackie Price off of the train in San Diego after Price let loose two five foot long snakes on the train from the trip to LA to San Diego. A coach full of women returning from the American Bowling Congress were extremely upset by the prank. After and then Boudreaux throws him off the off the train, and Indians owner Bill Veck said either the snakes go or Price goes, and the 35 year old infielder will be released by the team soon after that. I wouldn't mess with that prank either. Two snakes let go on the on the, on the train. Nope, not on a plane, on a train. I'd be pissed. With Jackie Price. This day, 1827, Beethoven passed away. Rip. One of my daughters, like, she's only eight months old, but she's got this toy, and it just plays, like, was it Fur Elise, Fur Elise, whatever yeah, it is? Fur over. It's just over, over, over. It'll over make her again. smarter. I'm supposed to, I guess. It'll pay off in the long run, I hope. A uh, very happy birthday goes out to Leonard Nimoy, Larry Page, founder of Google, Diana Ross, Robert Frost, Kenny Chesney, Marcus Allen, John Stockton, 
Von Miller and Steven Tyler all celebrating birthdays today. Pretty solid. Only one thing in the movie's television shows for you. It's a TV show. Came out this day, 1972. If I twitched my nose, what would you think of? What? It's a television show. This day, 72. I think of Pinocchio. No, that's not it. Twitch your nose? Twitch your nose. Um, okay. I, I don't know if this is going to help you. But one of the big flips on this TV show was the husband on the TV show was replaced. And there's a debate amongst people who the better Darren was. Darren was the husband. Darren. Darren. His wife's name was Samantha. She was the focal point of the show. Elizabeth Montgomery was the actress. She played Samantha. Oh, no. But Sex in the City? No, no. No, no 72. We're in 1972. It was no. way long time ago. Man, I had no idea. And she would twitch her nose. Twitch your nose. I don't Nothing? No. I might do I have the sound for you? Because the thing about this, there, there was a very famous uh kind of like uh thing when she would um no, nah, I don't have it. Um I, I I guess we're just grasping the straws here. Have you ever heard of Bewitched? Yeah. Yeah, Bewitched. Okay. She would twinkle her nose, she was a witch living in a real world, and then there was two Darren's. It was Dick York and Dick Sargent, and people always go back and forth on who the better Darren was. Okay. I'm the witch. So it debuted this day, 1972. Eight seasons there for you. All right, Ryan, let's go. Immaculate Grid. Maybe it's the time slot. Maybe we got to get the juices flowing on the time slot. I could. So if you're new and you don't know what the Immaculate Grid is, you got to fill it out up and down, left and right with players that played for both teams and got this to disco category. We have been on an extreme cold streak. Immaculate Grid kicking our ass right now. If it wants to live on this show... It better start shaping up, and we better start hitting some of them here. Ryan, our last statistical category, please. 5,000 career receiving yards. We have nine minutes to do it, and we're off receiving yards. Jets. Keyshawn? Who? Keyshawn Johnson? Or did you have another idea? I say Brandon Marshall. Okay. That but does... did he never play for the Eagles, did he? I don't think so. Either one. That's fine. That's I'll just fine. Cheers. Okay, that's fine. Um, We could do the aforementioned Odell Beckham there for the Giants. Positive Keyshawn Johnson. Yeah, but if you want to go with somebody else. 96 to 2006? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you want to just do Odell? You got to go Jimmy Smith there for the for the Jag. Now, the problem is you got to pick the right Jimmy Smith. Um, what were yours? 90 to probably early 2000s. It was in 92 to 2005? Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. All right. Okay, Bengals, Jets. CJ Uzama. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah, Bengals, Jets. Um, Eli Apple? Yeah, I was just going to say Eli Apple, yes. I was for some reason wondering if he played for the Jags, but I was overthinking it. Eli Apple is good. Uh, Jaguars, the Bengals. Tyler Eifert. Tyler Eifert. Good pull there. I thought he was going to be so good, man. I really thought he was going to be dominant. All right, now let's focus in on the Eagles. Okay. Eagles, because we just got them down the run here. Uh, Eagles, Jags. No, I was, I was thinking of some defensive back. That doesn't work. All right, let's focus in. You want to, which team? Pick, pick a team. Let's do that. Uh, didn't we have Eagles Giants before we struggled? Yeah. Matt Breida came to mind again there, but I don't think so because I know he played for the Giants. We had him in for the Dolphins the other day. Um. All right, quarterbacks. Josh McCown. Jets are good. I did, did he play for the Eagles? I think he did. I think he did, too. Oh, I'm good to rip it on that, but you want to move on to our other ones and yeah, see what else happens? Yeah. Okay. Uh, quarterbacks. Tyrod Taylor doesn't fit this. Uh, Josh Johnson doesn't fit this. He played for the Eagles, but I don't think he... Nick Foles, I don't know if he played for any of those teams. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. Was he not in Jacksonville? I don't know. I know Doug Peterson went there. I don't There's know. something about Nick Foles with the Jags. All right, if we really get down to it, we could have McCown and um, Nick Foles. <laughs> I'm, I'm running through so many players. I wish we could do Saquon, but he hasn't played yet. He hasn't played yet. Right? Yeah, he hasn't played yet. Um, all right, Eagles, Giants. Eagles, Giants. Kickers, nothing's coming to mind there.
Guys on the teams now. DeAndre Swift, no. Kenny Galladay, never. I keep coming back to him because somebody brought up the stupid contract that he got from a team. Um, Darius Slayton? Don't think so. That be a running back. That's what I'm trying to think of the running backs that left there. Miles Sanders went down to Carolina. He's out. Um, Jay Ajayi? No, that worked for Miami. Good pull there, but no. <sighs> Matt Breida. I keep coming back to him because, again, I know he works for the Giants. Olivier Vernon? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so on the Eagle side of things. Kevin Zeitler, no. That's the thing. Their offensive line, they pretty much drafted all of them. Justin Tuck? I don't think so. Oh, does Jason Peters, does he not work for the Jets? Did he not go there last year? I don't know. <laughs> Kick, uh, Eagles have gone through some kickers. Graham Gano, Graham Gano was the kicker for the Giants. I don't think I, know I don't that. know if he ever went there. Cody Parkey worked for the Giants, right? But I don't. Oh, I thought he was on the Eagles. Did he? Did he not kick for the Giants too? I don't. You know. might have to let Cody Parkey rip there if I we get it to it. I don't know if he played for the Giants. I don't know. I might be confusing him with Cade York. He went there on practice squad, and now he's back with the Browns. I mean, Alshon Jeffrey, Deshaun Jackson. No. No. I don't know why there's for some reason a tight end I feel like should really fit for this. Zach Ertz, no. No, I keep thinking like Eric Ebron, no. Um. Do we let McCown rip? I guess might as well. I mean, Frank I've, Gore didn't play for the Eagles. I don't no. Know. No. Darren Sproles? No, I don't think... Wait a minute. Why am I picturing Darren Sproles in a Giants jersey all of a sudden know, now? I don't, I don't know either. Let McCown rip. I feel semi-confident on that. I just spell McCown wrong. That's... I don't know. Okay. All right. All right. We're good. All right. And then for the Jags, Eagles. I'm s I don't know why I'm smelling Nick Foles on that. If you've got another option, I'm open to it, but I, I just keep sniffing Nick Foles on this one. I'm trying to think of like recent drafts or like even in the past, like Calais Campbell? No. He was there, um golly. <laughs> Who is that other edge rusher that they had there? Nah, I know Josh Allen's still there. They had another edge rusher. I believe in Chasen, but he just went to the, the Cowboys. <gasps> no, what? Ah, ah! Mike, no, Mike Glennon didn't play for the Eagles. I don't know. I think he might have. Because he would suffice there for the Giants. I know that. I know. We got two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes to get our nine minute thing. I think we might just need to let him. I, I feel like we're circling around kind of the same guys right now. So do you want to focus in? Nick, do you want to run Nick Foles there? Blake Which Bortles? One? Nothing. Blake Never Jaguars, went to the... you're saying? Yeah. Foles? I don't know if he's on the Eagles. I mean, the Jaguars. I, I don't know why for some reason I picture it. Maybe it's because him and Trevor Lawrence look a lot alike. I don't know. I don't know. Like, like Fred Taylor, running backs, Mark Brunel, maybe Mark Brunel. Ooh. I think Mark Brunel works. For which one? For Eagles. Uh, uh, Jags. Mark Brunel. Yeah, I think Mark Brunel. Because I think it's come up before. I forgot how many teams he actually played on. No. All right, rip um, rip Nick Foles there. Right here? Yeah. I don't think he did, man. All right, then do you want to put the other no, one? I don't know anybody else. Okay. Oh, he did. I told you. That's what I, I thought. Giants. Giants. Eagles. Eagles. I, um, I kind of like the Mike Lennon pick. I kind of like the Mike Lennon pick there. Um, Herschel Walker. Okay, that's one that we got to start remembering a little bit. Um, 
Man, I don't Dion Lewis. Oh, okay. Former Brown. Golden Tate. Oh, me I mean, I don't recognize any of these other names. Oh, we I forgot. Didn't do horrible. I mean, that was the one we were gonna miss. I guess that was the one to miss there. So be it. All right. Grid lives another day. That wasn't so bad on it. So we'll get it again to tomorrow. Ryan, let's get to our boost. Typico jackets. Let's go. Here we are. Three legs for tonight. Give me a little Cole Cylinder. Give me a little Johnny Gaudreau. Jackets plus a goal and a half. We are boosted up to what, Ryan? A very, very healthy. Plus 656. There it is. For our boost tonight, use that code Fontana100. When you sign up, deposit and bet $25. And you'll get $100 in bonus bets. As new customers, terms and conditions apply. Gambling problem, please call 1-800-GAMBLER. With our friends at Tipico, get it going for tonight. Ryan, we're going to get it going all week with... Bracket of the week. Best downtown, Tremont, West 25th bars. Run on through the 16 we got, please. Alrighty, we're going today is group one and group two. Group one, Flannery's, Edison's, Fishbowl, Bar 32. Okay, that's heavy. Group two is Hots, or is it Hoats? Hoats. Hoats. Hoats gets my love here. The Treehouse, Clevelander, and John Boy. Oh, I do love the Clevelander. And Good then, night, John Boy's great, too. And then group three and group four going tomorrow. Group three, Rowley Inn. Literary, Barley House, and City Tap. So, City Tap, so great. I used to go watch a lot of fights there. The thing about Rowley Inn, I've seen the line down the street. It's, you know where Rowley Inn is? It's across the street from the Christmas Story House. Okay. And Rowley Inn is legacy brunch. Legacy type brunch. Where I've had uh, uh, friends come in from out of town, like friends of friends. They will wait an hour to go to Rowley Inn. They will wait. To, and needed. And the cool thing at Rally, and they will seat the bar. Some places you get pissed off when they when they you have to have a reservation even for the bar too. But it's just so many people go there. And if you try to go there in December, <laughs> good luck uh, with the Christmas store out. Rally Inn is a dime. I, I love Rally. That's a great place. And then Group Four, sorry, I, Group Four, ABC Tavern, Parnell's, love it. Thirsty Parrot, and Inferno. Do we not put Wilberts in there? No, you didn't tell me Wilberts. What? What's Inferno? It's in the flats. Oh. I don't know if Wilberts is still open. <laughs> I think it is. You just get BOGO bombs. I love that place, man. It would probably be a good thing to know if it's open or not. I think it is. I guess I'll vote Thirsty Parrot in honor there. Uh, so, again, tweet. Uh, we'll send that out. At Matt Fontana Show. All the brackets there. Back to everything. Oh, I got a lot of people here. So, yeah, thank you. Ben Axelrod. I'm messaging him for tomorrow. And I said, it's not like, okay, I tweeted about the land. And everybody goes, well, what are you going to do, right, if you can't turn around? Ben tweets, even if they bought the land, it'll still be a worthwhile investment. They'll just put a top golf or something there instead. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. That's my whole point. People are like, why would you invest in that? I mean, he also said we're probably still getting the Dome and Brook Park. And then shout out to Daryl Ryder, 92.3. Daryl tweets, keep in mind, the Bears actually bought land and began site prep in the suburbs in Chicago before pivoting back to, to Soldier Field. Browns are just showing their willingness to leave downtown from the new Dome Stadium in a more accessible location. That's all that this is. I guess, okay, maybe they're taking my quote kind of out of context. My whole point was, it's not quite the threat. It's the illusion of it. I still think downtown is going to get done. So Ben and I agree that they could just still flip that land and put something else there. It's not that big of a deal. And Daryl is right. It's enough of a threat to say that they'll just go and do it. That they'll just go, like, if we need to pull the trigger on it, we will. It comes back to my ultimate point. The Browns want, in my opinion, the Browns want to stay downtown. If they were willing and truly wanted to go to Brook Park, they would just go to Brook Park. If they really wanted out, then this would be signed, sealed, and delivered. We are moving to Brook Park in 2028. The fact that it's not tells you their preference is still to stay downtown of where they're at. Whether the preference is because they want the city to pick up part of the tab, because it's cheaper than building a whole new stadium, I don't know. But the fact that they're not... Completely moving forward on Brook Park tells me that their goal is to stay downtown. So if their goal is that, and it has to be the goal of the city of Cleveland to keep them there, then that's what's going to happen. Then that, in my opinion, is what is going to happen. If that is the number one priority for both sides, whether or not it's perfect, I understand it's not perfect, but if the Haslam's 
by just not buying that land, and Ben and I are on the same page here, buy a land and put up a top golf. Sell it to somebody else. I don't know. People act like because if the Haslam's bought that town or bought that land, they'd be stuck with it forever. No. No. A mega hooters? That's what you really are all in on. I don't know why. You're all over that for some reason. But that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Ben and I are on the same page. And then other people tweeted, the Bears just bought 130 acres in the Burbs, and they're going back to the lakefront. It's not a bad investment. I've been – was that not what I was screaming at people earlier? All the amateur real estate investors out there to say, hey, man, what do they do with the land? They'd sell it. And even if they lost $10 million – on a sale of the land in Brook Park to help them gain 50 million or gain 75 million, or in this case, 500 million from the city, that's still a worthwhile investment. 500 is more than 10. If they lose $10 million on a sale of that, of that Brook Park property, but it helped them get 500 million from the city, it's a worthwhile investment. Good math. There it is. That's how that works. Math is what we do right here. All right, coming up later. We got Josh Marie Cripp. Tell me you don't want to listen to Josh today talk about the new kickoff rules. That's coming up. Enter the Jungle James Rapine and crew. Back tomorrow. I'm messaging Ben right now. We're going to Ben Axe right hopefully on tomorrow. We'll talk to him about everything. Stay with us. Appreciate you joining us this morning as always on Big Play. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Matt Fontana Show. As always, take it easy.